This is the next lecture for the McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Compu Introduction to Computational Thinking. Now, we've been exploring the topic of what is computational thinking, and we stop with a very important question, which I'm, which I'm going to call the fundamental question of computational thinking. And this question is, what can and cannot be done with computing. So if, you're, if we're trying to understand computational thinking, we want to determine what the limits are of computational thinking. Are there any limits? So the question divides into actually two questions. What are the theoretical limits of computing? Uh, what, what are the limits where we don't worry about what our computer can do in terms of its size or speed. We imagine we have ultimate size and speed. Uh, what are the limits of computing? And the other question, what are the practical limits? What are the limits with computers we have today? So I would like to ask you a question. Are there any theoretical limits on what can be computed? So what you should do is stop the video, think about this, and give me an answer. And then when you have your answer, start the video again. Okay, I believe you have come back now. I will tell you what the answer is. So the question is, are there any theoretical limits on what can be computed? Yes. Not every problem can be solved computationally. We can have problems we'd like to solve computationally, but they cannot be solved. And this subject is one of the fundamental parts of computing. And this is something you will be thinking about and studying throughout your entire four years at McMaster University. So now I have another question. I will, uh, the question is pretty simple. Who was Gottfried Leibniz? Here's a picture of him. You can see he has this amazing black wig that he's wearing. So the question is, who was he? And I've given you five answers. Stop your video, think about him. Decide what are the correct answers. Now that you've come back, it turns out all these answers are correct. Gottfried Leibniz was a great philosopher with an optimistic view of the world. He is in many ways known most as a philosopher. He's a mathematician, a mathematician who invented calculus. He's one of the first great computer scientists. And he's also one of the first great computer engineers. That's why we're interested in thinking about him. And he's a brilliant polymath. So he lived in the 1600s and early 1700s. He was German, and as I said, he was a polymath. And he's not just, well, first of all, what is a polymath? A polymath is someone who can do more than one thing really well. And he certainly could do many things really well. And when I say he's of almost unrivaled brilliance, it's hard to really find anyone in history who is as brilliant in so many areas as Leibniz. Uh, probably the biggest competitor would be Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a tremendous scientist. He was a tremendous engineer. He was a musician. He, he could do many things, but of course he was completely unparalleled painter. He painted in the Renaissance in Italy during one of the greatest explosions of artistic development. And he, and he was generally considered by everyone except maybe Michelangelo as the best. So Leibniz is of that level. He is like Leonardo da Vinci. And he was trained in philosophy and law, but he made many contributions, major contributions, in many areas. And of course, you probably know that he developed calculus independently of Newton. 
And this caused a, actually a huge intellectual war, I should say a war between intellectuals, between the British and the Germans about who really, who really should have priority for developing calculus. And today we pretty much assume that Leibniz and Newton both developed the ideas of calculus and they did it independently. And in many ways, the way Leibniz developed calculus, I find much more satisfying. Uh, Leibniz notation is much more successful. It, we still use it today in calculus courses. Notation like dx over dy, or the integral sign, and so forth. But we're interested in Leibniz because he was a great computational thinker. So, as I said, he was a great computer scientist and engineer. So this is a little bit surprising because this is the 1600s when he lived. There weren't any of computers like we have today. How could he be a great computer scientist and engineer? Well, I'm going to explain how that's possible. One thing I will mention right off the bat is he developed the binary number system. He didn't invent it, but he realized its value. He realized that the value of the binary number system is you can express any number using just two symbols, let's say 0 and 1. Now, he was very interested in how to mechanically calculate things. And he invented something called the Stoffelwalze, the stepped reckoner. It would be an English translation. And this was a mechanical machine that could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots. So he designed it, and he had technicians build it for him. And this is the most advanced calculating machine that was ever made up to that time. This is why he is one of the first great computer engineers. And his design, surprisingly, was even used in American mechanical calculators up to the 1970s. So he took calculation seriously. He built a machine to do it. And he understood the nuts and bolts of calculation. And he had this great model. I, I love this model. His model was calculamus. So calculamus in Latin means let us calculate. And the reason this is his model is because Leibniz was always thinking about how could we, how can we solve a problem by calculation? And his hope was, and it's, he wrote it down once, that when philosophers get together, remember, he's mostly known as a philosopher, when philosophers get together and they have an argument, whatever that might be, is there one god or two gods? They have an argument. Leibniz had this vision that they could answer their question using calculation. In fact, he wanted to see if we could answer all questions using calculation. So, Leibniz is, up in many ways, one of the most fantastic computational thinkers because he was interested, before we had modern computers, to push as far as he could what we could do with calculation or computation. So, he postulated a language, a universal language, which he called the Characteristica Universalis. So he was trying to develop a language in which you could express all scientific ideas. So whatever idea you wanted to express, you could express. Like you, could ex you could say something like, the sun will burn out in a hundred years. So you could express that, any kind of idea. And he also postulated something he called the calculus ratio senator. And this is basically a computing device. And it's a device you can use to determine whether statements that you express in the Characteristica Universalis are true or false. So I could write down my statement, the sun will burn out in 100 years. I give it to my calculus ratio senator. 
I turn it on and it comes back and gives me an answer. Yes or no. And that will be what is the truth. We can use this to determine if the cat sun really will burn out in a hundred years. So the question is, is this at all possible? No, it's not possible. But no one knew this when Leibniz proposed this idea. Leibniz is basically saying, let's imagine we can just solve any problem with computation. And no one could say, stand up and say, no, that's not possible. No one could say that until 1936. And in 1936, two very important people, Alonzo Church and Alan Turing, independently showed that there are undecidable decision problems. So a decision problem is a problem where you uh, have a set of things, and if you choose something arbitrarily from that set of things, you can, you can a answer a question whether something is true or false. So there's many, many decision problems, but there are some decision problems that are undecidable. That means we can't create a computer that can decide the problem. So, so for instance, if we take the set of all natural numbers, we can have a decision problem, is a natural number prime or not? That is a decidable decision problem. Because you probably learned in high school how you can determine whether a natural number is prime or not. Basically, you just have to show that doesn't have any factors but one in itself. So that is a decidable decision problem. But there are undecidable decision problems that cannot be solved by computers. And, a lot, and Church and Turing showed this in 1936. And this pr proved that Leibniz's great vision, his dream, is not possible. But we must commend Leibniz, because in the 1600s, he was willing more than anyone else to think about what computation was and what we could use it for. Now, I should point out that the work of Church and Turing were very heavily influenced by Kurt Gödel's proofs of his famous first and second incompleteness theorems. These theorems show the limits of using proof to capture truth. Um, in many ways, these are some of the most important theorems in logical thinking. So, even though Church and Turing show there are no undecidable decision problems, they're definitely, both of them are definitely standing on the shoulders of Kurt Kerr. Okay, we'll stop here, and that will end our topic of what is computational thinking.